It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live, and my timing sucked on that intro. <laughs> and today, I'm so excited, we've got my favorite guest on the show. Oof, I hope now the other guests watch. It's Robin Frederick, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Um, I haven't seen Robin since the road rally, in which, of course, she hit it out of the park as she always does the road rally. The ballroom was full, the line of people buying her books and getting her autograph, very long. Um, everything just could not have gone better. So welcome to the show, Robin. Uh, thanks for having me. And I had a wonderful time at the road rally. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, great crowd, terrific group of people. I get to geek out on songwriting and you know, where else can I do that? So I loved it, loved it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you did. Uh, I think we were all a little trepidatious about how much COVID would play into things. And, and I went out and bought 5,000 masks and several gallons of hand sanitizer and none of it got used. I mean, literally I pissed away hundreds of dollars on that <laughs> stuff. But if there's ever another pandemic, which I, Pray to God there isn't, but I'm better prepared than the average person, I must say. It's <laughs> great. great. Good yeah, to know. That's Good something know. you don't want to be prepared for, but what the heck. Um, anyway, let me... Oh, I forgot to open up the chat room today. I told you. I was just telling Robin I'm a little out of practice, still getting back in the saddle here. Uh, let me get the chat room open so we can say hi to everybody, and then we are going to jump right in with Robin's nine suggestions for becoming a better songwriter in 2023. That's a lot. We're going to have to jam it in because I know when you and I get going, we just we just love talking about this stuff. Well, it's good stuff. Um, and I'm going to have you do most of the talking today uh, okay. because you Always are my pleasure. you are the resident pro. I can't believe I forgot to open the chat room. I feel so bad. Uh, Come on. All right, there we go. Hi, guys in the chat room. Pop out the chat. There it is. All right. Okay, we've got the folks in the chat room looking at us. Great to see them. Um, <laughs> The amazing Taxi's Hand Sanitizer, that's right. And, and by the way, you guys, I'm going with the Criteria Studios. I called it C last time, it's Studio D, where the Bee Gees, uh, they actually built that room for the Bee Gees. Um, and that's where a lot of their stuff was done. And this is the refurbished Studio D of Criteria. So uh, that said, Robin, let's jump right into it. Um, let's just, I'm just going to let you roll and I'll chime okay. in, you know. Whenever, okay, so hit it. Let's just start, well, you asked me to do this, so I'm just going to start with what you asked me to do, which is nine ways to become a better songwriter in 2023. So I didn't have to think about this for too long. It took me longer <laughs> to write them down than it did to think of them, because I could probably come up with another nine without too much difficulty. But if, if I wanted to put them kind of in order, like what's I, there isn't one that's more important than the others, but let me just start with the big one. Okay, the big one is, if you want to become a better songwriter in 2023, and, and that's your goal, if that's your goal, right? That's a good goal to have. I'm going to become a better songwriter, right? <clears throat> but it's too big. I'm going to become a better songwriter in 2023. How am I going to do that? What am I going to do to do that? So you need to break it down in steps, right? It's a good goal because it is one that's under your control. A not good goal would be, I'm going to get three film and TV placements in 2023. Right. Because you don't have any control over that. Um, that's going to be somebody else's decision. But you can write better songs. You can write more songs. Um, you can, you know, get expand your catalog and have more chances to pitch. All these things you do have under co your control. And so um, you want to pick a goal like, yes, I want to be a better songwriter this year. And then because that's so big, you want to break it down into steps. Yeah. Narrow. So let's say that. Um, the first thing I would suggest as a step is um, identify your strengths. Just sit down and make a list of what you do well. Are you, you know, a good musician or are you a good lyric writer? 
Um, you know, what is your str what are your strengths? Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? Can you, uh, you know, m maybe melodies are your strength. Um, so make a list of those things that you have that you're good at, because those are the things, if you lean on them, that will help you write faster. So if you write lyrics well, then look towards the lyric heavy genres like singer songwriter. And if you don't produce your own tracks, uh, you know, and you haven't got a whole lot of plugins and crazy stuff, loops and samples, <laughs> then probably you shouldn't write in um, dance club dance. Right. Don't go for club dance. OK, so you want to be able to write more and better. So identifying your strengths is the first place to start and then take a look at what's holding you back. What are the things that slow you down? What are the things that make you stop writing? What are the things that make you put a song in your closet and not take it out again? Um, those kinds of things. So if you do that, then you can say, well, um, my melody writing isn't very good. So you can then either study melody writing or, and or um, get a collaborator. Um, those two things, learning more and getting collaborators and filling in for your weak spots are going to come up more than once today. Because those are the important things. As you break down, what do you need? Where are your weak spots? Then you're going to look for how do I change those? How do I fill that? How do I strengthen that? And those are the things that will, I promise you, make you a better songwriter. You'll be writing more songs, and they'll be better songs. And the funny thing is, that comes right back around to that goal that you couldn't have, which is um, more songs will get placed. More songs will get interest. More songs will get picked up by libraries. Um, more songs will get out there. And that's what you want, uh, but it's not a goal that you have control over. So take control of the things you can't do and then um, look at what you can do. Make it steps, break it down. You can even break down the steps of learning to write melodies better. You can break that down into sub steps. So just make it something that's handleable, something you can do once a week, two or three times a week, um, spend 30 minutes or an hour on this every week and you will get better. You'll become a better songwriter. Okay. So You're so one. eloquent that you can actually come up with a word like handleable. Hand, handleable. handleable. <laughs> I'm not even sure that's a word, Robin, but you made it sound so believable. It is now. Good, good. I love believability. Is that true? Um, okay, let's do another one. Let's do another okay, one. Okay, please. Okay. Um, respect your inspiration. Respect your first idea. Respect the emotion that drives you to write this song. Now, we all, you know, we all love our inspired lines. And, and we go, oh, I love that line. I, that's the best line I've ever written, you know, and you write that down and you start a song with it. And that's really good. That's exactly where you should start. Start with your feelings, the feelings that make you want to write a song. That's exactly where you should start. But know that you're not going to get locked into that because that's the first draft of your song. That's, what you, that's your inspiration. That's the driving motor behind the song. But don't get locked into it because what happens a lot of times is inspiration will just dump a whole lot of lines on you. When it's turned on, it's on. And it just gives you line after line and you're going to write these lines down, right? And when you write them down, they look like they ought to be in the same song, but they're probably not. If you've got two or three inspired lines, maybe one of them isn't like the other two. And that's what happens with inspiration. It's not a linear thing. It's like, you know, it's like your like dream dreams. You're, you're, you know, on the bus with your schoolmates and then you're on the beach with your parents and then you're on a stage somewhere with no clothes on. And then you're and your dream is just throwing those things at you. And it doesn't care that they don't make sense in a row. Inspiration's the same way. So get all the inspiration you can, get all the emotion down that you can, and call that your first draft, okay? Then keep that first draft. And if you've got any melody ideas or grooves that go with it, record that and, and never, never give it up, never give that away, never lose that, don't ever erase that, keep it. Because that's got all the heart in it. Then for your second draft, you're gonna turn to songcraft to make sure that that inspiration is understandable and relatable and that listeners can feel like they can engage with it that they'll you know they understand it and they want to be there and they want to stick around for more and that's what songcraft is there for it's not there because it's a rule or anything else it's oh you've got to write it this way and you have to do this structure and you have to do that it's not there for those reasons it's there because it's what listeners need in order to stick with you 
and understand what you're saying and get involved in it and want to hear more. That's what Songcraft is there for. But it's always at the service of emotion. It's always there to support emotion. It never should get out ahead of the emotion and inspiration you started with. If you start thinking about things and putting them in because they're clever or because they rhyme or, you know, or, or because this is the way I ought to do it, you're going to lose that initial inspiration. Go back, listen to what you wrote, you recorded or what you wrote down, read what you wrote down and get back to what you originally thought you wanted to do get back in touch with it come back to your song and work on your second draft some more by doing speaking of song way, sorry uh, <laughs> sorry okay, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um you know so you, that's 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 that one okay <laughs> i'm <laughs> i'm yellow uh i was gonna say speaking of songcraft, i am going to give away wow i am very yellow i'm going to give away one of robin's books today shortcuts to hit songwriting which has, has become it's a Bible. It's it's not a book you read cover to cover. It's a book that makes you feel like you've got Robin sitting next to you when you write. And anytime you hit a stumbling block, does this rhyme well? Um, I, I've got writer's block. She's literally got like your best friend's answer to everything in this book. And people that have purchased it over the years rave about it. It's got like four point six out of five stars or 4.7 or something on YouTube. Anyway, great book. Um, and we are going to give one away. So don't let me forget uh, near the end of the show to do that. All right. What's your next one? Okay. The next one is avoid getting stuck. To be a better songwriter, you've got to finish songs. And I can't tell you how many people say to me, oh, this was a song I put in my closet and I just couldn't finish it. I didn't know how to finish it. I got stuck on verse two. Everybody gets stuck in verse two. Um, <laughs> and that's often because you don't know what you're writing about. When you get to verse two, you still don't know what you're writing about. Right. If you're, if you're writing out of inspiration, okay, you've got these great lines and you go, okay, I got this great verse. And then you go, okay, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Some more line, I need some more lines for the chorus. And you get some more lines for the chorus. You have no idea what you're writing about. <laughs> There's no way you can write verse two. You just, because what will you write about? So the, the way to get around that and not get stuck and put that song in the closet and probably never take it again, um, is when you start your song at that point where you're getting that initial idea and those inspired lines and all that. When you're doing that, then sit down for a minute and think about it and say, what is this about? What, am I, what are these inspired lines I have? What are these lines that just came to me? Or what does this feeling feel like? And, and who is singing it? Um, yes, it's my song and I'm singing it right now, but Am I, you know, who's the character who's singing it? Is there somebody else in the song? Does there have to be somebody else? Am I singing to somebody? All those things will help you understand what your song is about. Then if you want to take it even further and ensure that you will finish that song, at this point, go ahead and sketch out the rest of it. Even if you just have three or four lines at the beginning, they're telling you something. They're telling you, you know, what the song, what's the situation, who's in it, who's the singer. You get all that information in just a couple lines. And from that point on, you really can't fight that. So sketch out the rest of the song. Um, I was just doing a um, uh, uh, one of my monthly newsletters where I often do song guides to hit songs. And I chose to do a song guide to Zach Bryan's song, country hit, uh, Something in the Orange. And I did that because I really couldn't understand the title. And I was really curious what the song was about. How is, what's he going to say about something in the orange? And he prison, says that was prison a, jumpsuits. Well, or is it the citrus fruit? <laughs> right. is it, what, you know? And he says that was the inspired line. That was, that was the line that started the song. And so, um, and <laughs> when you read interviews with him, he tells you what it is. But here's the thing, when a listener comes to the song, they don't know what it is, unless you happen to have seen an interview with the guy. So um, it turns out, I, so I went through and I did a develop, I, I did a sketch of the song. I call it a development path. I go through the whole thing to see how he's developing this idea from the title. And so in the first verse, he says, um, I was, you know, it's the dawn, I woke up. So, oh, immediately you go, okay, sunrise, orange. I get it, I get it. Okay, so in the sunrise, he says, I still, I miss you, and I'm, but I'm hopeful things will work. 
That's where the song starts. Now, you're going to write a sketch. If you were to do a sketch on this, you'd probably do something like he's doing. He says, um, I have hope that it'll work out. Verse two, he realizes she doesn't love him. She doesn't say what he expects her to say when he says, I love you. She doesn't do it back. And so he's, he says, I, I get it. You don't love me, but I can't let go. That's verse two. Then the chorus, this is how I feel about it, which is what most choruses say. This is how I feel about it. That's a chorus. Next verse is, he longs to go back to the way things were. Now we get a little bit of the history, but notice how late in the song it comes. Yeah. It doesn't come in that first verse. I met you on a Monday and we had we fell in love in this instant. It doesn't, none of that happens until verse three. And he says, I wish we could go back to when we used to dance on the wooden floor and the boards would creak and the, it's just beautiful, this third verse. Then chorus, and this is how I feel about the breakup. And now we know what it means to him and what it was like. Verse four, he pleads with her to turn around and come back. So we've actually gone from, I'm hopeful to, now I really understand that you're leaving. There's no storyline there. There's Boy, no that's of cheery. Events. <laughs> Isn't it? Oh, it's a very dark song. And yet it's huge. It's at the top of the chart. It's the most unlikely country hit I have well, ever I've heard. Well, I have a question very uh, relative to what you just said. It, do you remember my dear departed friend, Ralph Murphy? The two of you each have excellent, or Ralph had, he passed away a few years ago. Um, many, many great recommendations, but your styles of teaching are very different. Your approaches mm -hmm. to the way you analyze things, very different, but I think there is a mutual respect there. But you both agreed on oftentimes the second verse should be made the first verse, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't you say that once? And oh, I think, yeah. yeah, and you just made the point with the, either the third or fourth verse in the Zach Bryant thing that um, that's when he really yeah. tells you. So why wouldn't you want to take that verse to the top and let the listener know what this is about right at the top and, and just because get to the- Because the history isn't what it's about. But the can't you- The history isn't what it's about. Yeah, yeah. okay. Thank you for, for thank you for asking this question because it's a really good question. The history of what happened is of little interest to the to the listener. What the listener is interested in is the emotion. Listeners are like voyeurs. They're looking in through the window, going, "How do you feel? What's going on? Tell me. I want to hear all about it." But they don't care about when you met or what happened. They care about what you feel. And in that moment, you put the listener in that moment with the singer, who is saying. I, I am afraid we're, you're leaving me, but I, I think it will work out. I do. This is what we see in a scene in a TV show. In a TV show, we don't start with the history. We plunk the listener, the viewer, right into the middle of that action. And so, by the way, this, this song has been used in two television shows, a major one, Fire Country, uh, it was used in. And um, it's a perfect song for underneath a scene in which somebody's relationship is breaking up. And that re the the emotions of that moment, um, you know, I woke up and I'm I'm still missing you, but I something in the sunrise tells me that it'll things will work out. And then the next verse is, I said I love you, and I can tell you're not saying it to me, and uh, you're everything to me. This is what listeners love. They don't care about the history when they met or what they used to do, but it is important some it, to bring it in to show us what it is he's missing. What was it that was so good about this relationship that's now breaking up? But if we didn't know it was breaking up first, we wouldn't really care about what the history of the relationship is. It's right. all about the emotion for listeners. And that's why a lot of times I will take the first verse and move it to the second and take the drop the listener, pull that second or third verse up to the top and drop the listener into the middle of the situation. You don't love me. I'm crying. This is yeah. it. We're done. That's the situation. And that's where listeners want to be. Then if I say to you, yeah, but it used to be so great. Don't you remember when we used to do this? That just adds more pathos to the situation and it deepens it, which is why it works so well for the second or late for the verse after the chorus. Then we get there. The other thing, by the way, folks, is film and television. They don't really want to hear the backstory first. Right. <laughs> okay. They don't want to hear any story because it'll yeah, conflict yeah. with the script. I've got to adjust my white belt. Oh, now I'm I'm fine. <laughs> ah, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I am having... Oh, well. Oh, well. I don't yeah. see much difference. It's okay. uh, uh, see, I don't see the backdrop. Yeah, so... 
I'm I'm a little know. little yellow. It's okay. We're talking doing a song with orange in the lyric, you know. Yeah, um, there you go. <laughs> I'm that turning orange. Hit. Yeah, if somebody said that would be a hit to me, I would never have said, yeah, that'll be a hit. Um, so, so interesting I, song. Yeah. I have a question. When you bring yeah. that latter verse up um, in, in those circumstances, when you bring it to the pole position, as it were, um, mm -hmm. is it also a good thing to trim the fat at that point? because people, when they get into the historical detail, will probably write a lot of stuff that the listeners aren't aware, you know, and you don't need it. Um, so is it a good exercise if you do that to look and see if there's any fat that you need oh, to sure. trim off of that steak? Okay. Yeah, one of my favorite songs that does this, uh, it's Taylor Swift's Style. I love that song, Style. And um, what she does is she, she puts us in the moment your car coming up the driveway, I'm getting into the car, we're taking off, driving fast as we can, no headlights, it's just so exciting and it's heart pounding. And and all of that is in the moment and that's where we are with them and what her feelings are about him. Then in the after the chorus, that wonderful chorus in that song, after that, she has two lines of history. And she says, you know, every time you come up, you come around, we know we're just gonna go around, this is just gonna go around and around again. Every time we end up, you know, it's fabulous physicality, physicality but um, the rest of it, we just end up fighting. And she does that in about two lines when she says, every time you show up, we just go around and around again. It's gonna be the same thing. And yeah. she's already shown us what the thing is. So we know from what she has said, we know what the history is when she says, it just goes around every time we end up in the same place. And that's all she has to say about the history so that we know they have a history that's just like this. The truth is listeners don't need much history. The only reason they need history is to know what you lost. What is the cost of what is happening? Well, if it was this great, the cost must be great. But we have to know there's a cost to pay first. Then we found out how much the cost is because, ah, oh, we used to love to dance until the floorboards those wooden floorboards. and is it relatable to listeners to a large number of listeners because in order for them to really feel what that cost is it's better if they've been through it and go oh i know how horrible that feels yeah. and so many people have been through breakups i mean that's pretty universal so by the time you get through the first and second verse you know this is a breakup this is serious and he's really upset about it and he sings that chorus and says this is how i feel we don't really need a backstory in this one because it's very clear uh, what it is. There's another song called Cold by Chris Stapleton, mm -hmm. where he says, when you broke my heart, it shattered like a rock through a window. That's the first two lines of verse one. That's really all you need. You know, you don't need yeah. to know the details of this one. And he never goes into it. He just says, you broke up with me. How dare you? Second verse. Now, what am I going to tell our friends? You know, <laughs> what am I going to tell our friends? That's the second verse. Um, so really, the cost, the, the history is there for a reason if you need it to be. Otherwise, I urge you to drop it out because listeners don't care unless they need to hear about it. So sketching out your song, as to get back to what I was saying, is if you sketch out your song, you can see where the history might land. It might land after your first chorus. If you're starting with, I met you on a Monday at the dance, I, you know, we sat at the bus stop and talked with each other. By that, at that point, listeners don't know you or know who you're talking to or know anything about that relationship, and they're not involved. They're just not involved. But once you get them involved in this is a breakup, uh, or or I'm falling in love and I you know this is instant love. Uh, then in the second verse you can say and when you walked into the room tonight I you know and I saw you for the first time that was it was like a lightning bolt. You can do that. So sketch out your song, and with your listener in mind, what are they going to be involved in? I'm glad you brought that up, Michael, because that's a reason to not start with the history when you sketch out your song. Get us involved right away in the first verse, then as he does and then um, take us to the feelings in the chorus second verse you can fill in the history or you can talk about what our hopes and what our hopes and plans are i mean depending on what your song is about and then chorus again and then in your bridge uh, you've got something else to talk about then you can say well in my bridge i might talk about um how i always fear i feared this would happen or this um turn you know you can actually sort of universal well it happens to everybody i guess this is just the way life is all kinds of things you can do in your bridge 
Yeah, um, some, but, something that relates to the rest of the song, but isn't the, in the linear progression of events. That's right. You got it right. exactly. I have a whole shortcut on bridges in there. And here's the three things you could, or four things that you, I would suggest you put in your bridge. Um, and they're very useful because it gives the listener a chance to take a break, a little more information before you go to that last chorus. By the time you've sketched out your song and you have an idea of what you might want to say, doesn't mean you're locked into it. You can change it if it's really not working for you. But it's a good way to see to the end of your song. And once you see to the end of your song, you go, OK, I think I can get there. And then that song is likely to get finished rather than put in the closet. I have tremendous respect, as you well know, for Nashville writers. Anybody who makes fun of country music deserves to be, you know, like hit upside the head with one of your books. Um, it's those people. Those people, those Nashville writers work so hard, so long, and interact with each other, and they're constantly teaching as they're figuring stuff out. That goes back to your collaboration comment a few minutes ago. They do not. I've actually been in three Nashville writing sessions in my lifetime, not very many, but enough to know that they know all these craft things, but they don't sit there and ponder craft they've been around it for so long that it just comes naturally. It's kind of like turning. You don't think I'm going to turn the wheel of my car to the left so I can make a left turn at this 90 degree corner. Mm -hmm. You just do it. And that's the way they write. So I completely agree with you and think that the more often people employ the suggestions that you give them, that they won't have to think about it someday. They won't have to, maybe kind of a checklist when they think a song is done, go back and go, okay, does this progression of ideas make sense? Should I think about moving verse two up to verse one or verse three up to verse one? Um, nope, that's good. But as they're actually writing, they don't have to think about turning the wheel, the steering wheel to the left. Yeah, Just an that's observation. when you can embed those things. You're exactly right. When people have written songs long enough uh, and they have solved enough problems over and over because they're often the same problems that we all face over and over in every song. Um, how to write verse two, uh, for example. Um, when you've done that enough, it becomes uh, habitual and there's nothing wrong with habits. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk about habits in a little bit. Let me, let me just put that off for just a moment and talk about an interest, a way to solve the problems that we all run into. Um, and that, that, you know, everybody in every song, whether you're writing alone or you're writing with a collaborator, you're likely to run into the problem of, A, what do I say in my chorus or what do I say in my next verse or how do I transition? How do I transition from my pre-chorus to my chorus? Um, melodies, you know, my melody feels a little boring. How can I make it more interesting? All of those things that we all face. Um, one of the best ways to deal with that is to study successful songs to help solve problems. Um, we too often, we just sit there and try to force our own creativity to solve a problem. And really you're reinventing the wheel. And you shouldn't have to do that. It takes too long. And if you wanna write more songs this year and better songs, you don't wanna be reinventing the wheel every time you run into a problem. So one of the best ways to do that is to go study successful songs and see how they solve that problem. You know, so pick a song that you like um, let's say, I mean, and don't study songs you don't like. I just don't think you have to spend that much time with songs you don't like. Um, <laughs> and, and, and if you've got a problem with your lyrics feeling like they're flat, uh, you're getting feedback that says, I'm just not, you know, feeling what you're writing about, or I don't understand, or, um, the lyrics sound a little familiar or a little dated or any of those things, go look at some successful songs that you like and look at what they're doing with the lyrics. How are they using imagery? How are they using comparisons? You know, lo my love is like, you know, love hit me like a lightning strike. Uh, you know, it, it's how, how are they using those, this is like that? Because that's how we get emotions into song. We describe the, my love is like that. I feel, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm as sad as, you know, a lonesome river. Um, that's how we do it. It's, this is like that. I am as sad as a lonesome river. Um, comparisons, what are they doing with the melody? If you're having problem with melody, listen to how that melody is constructed. Um, how much repetition is in the melody? And when does it, when do they get variation? And then do they repeat that variation? Then do they come back to the original melody or do they go to a new section? Melody patterns, and patterns of line lengths, patterns of line rhythm, 
uh, patterns of repetition and variation, those are very important to listeners. It helps listeners remember your song. It's what makes listeners, it's what makes the song memorable. Um, and if you don't have enough repetition, it's not memorable, it's not catchy. If you have too much repetition, it gets boring and it gets predictable. Well, how much is too much? Go listen to your favorite songs that are successful, especially recent ones, and take a look at how they're doing it. Why do you like that melody? Um, if you like it, there must be something about that melody that you like. So go find out what it is, then learn from it, bring it back to your song, adapt it to your song. You're not going to copy it, but you'll adapt it to what you're doing. And then you'll find that your melody comes to life. Now, what you were just saying, Michael, is these people who do it all the time, it's second nature. It's like riding a bicycle. Yeah. You've done it so much. You have muscle memory. At first, when you start learning new things, like riding a bicycle, you have to have training wheels or you have to have somebody hold you up or whatever. You fall over a lot. But once you start doing it and you do it enough, which means you be songwriting several times a week, practicing this stuff, practicing your melody writing, it becomes second nature. It's muscle memory. And you don't have to think about it. At first you do, then you don't. But you learn it from what successful people are doing with their songs. This is what I did at the Road Rally this year. When I played three successful songs and said, look at this, look at the melody, look at the lyric, look at what they're doing with the chords, look at what they're doing with the production. You can learn all of that from successful songs that you like. Sadly, a lot of people give up before they get to the point of muscle memory, and that's where things would have taken off for them, but it's just too much work, too much time, and they give up, go home with their tail between their legs. And I know that you and I agree on this. It's heartbreaking. You see somebody that wants it so badly in their heart. They've wanted it their whole life, and now they've got the tools, and they go for it. It's like, wow, this is taking longer than I thought. I'm out. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, um, what's true. your next one? Um, create raw material before you start your song. What do you uh, mean by raw material? Uh, okay, so you sit down to write a song, okay? I sit down to write a song. If I don't have something already in my head that I want to write, then I'm just sitting there kind of trying to desperately to come up with stuff to write. And, and you, that's the last place that you're going to think of anything you actually want to write because you're sitting there trying to force yourself to think of something you want to write. So I say... Um, have lists, and, and I know people, you've heard this before, but you may not actually do it, but you keep a notebook in your car, you keep you know, a notebook in your, with you in your pocket, in your purse, wherever, and keep that, or keep your phone with you and sing your ideas. Raw material is titles, hook lines, uh, lyric lines for a verse or a chorus, anything that uh, strikes you as interesting, um, melody lines and phrases, um, keep a file of music ideas. We now have phones that record. Thank you. I mean, do you remember having to haul? I mean, I used to keep a cassette player in my car um, because you had to record the idea on the spot because you won't remember it when you get home. I used to pick up the phone and call my own, you know, voicemail. Right. And record it on the voicemail. Um, I always forget what I'm calling for. By the time it would pick up an answer, I go, what the hell is I calling for? But that's a function right. of getting older, I'm sure. I think so. Yeah, I didn't have that when I was 20. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anything, but I do know I'll never remember that melody or when I, by the time <laughs> I get home, that's not going to happen at any age. So um, yeah, and keep these and then put them in a place that's organized so that when you sit down to write, you can open your file of titles, titles and lyric lines, open your file of melody ideas with lyrics or without lyrics, open your file of grooves, sit down with a guitar and pick a few songs you like and copy the groove on your guitar and record that. So it's you playing it, not the hit song. And then keep that, forget what song it came from and that's fine. Um, and then when you go to write a song, run through your grooves. I have, I have clients who write from a groove, they always do. The groove just, it, that's the thing that inspires their emotion to, to come out with something, their inspiration. Um, the words flow when they have the rhythm. Um, and so all of these things will help you when you sit down to write and you won't be wasting an hour sitting there banging your head on your desk or your keyboard or your guitar and trying to come up with ideas uh, to write because that's just a waste of time. And you can't afford to waste time like that if you want to write faster and write better and get these songs done. You need to sit down and go, okay, I know what I'm working on today, go. And then stop when you get to a point where you go, yeah, I, I like this, I like what I'm writing, record it stop 
and and walk away go work on another song or go do whatever it was you needed to do watch tv whatever take a walk you can come back and work on it some more or wait until the next time you have time to do an hour or so and sit down and work on the song um, and that will keep those songs churning it'll keep them going rather than getting stuck sitting there um, trying to be creative when creativity just doesn't feel like working um, and that can happen anytime You'd be talking to friends. Bob Dylan used to say, you know, when I'm talking with friends or they're talking, I'm not really listening to what they're saying. I'm listening for lines. I'm listening yeah. for lyrics. Um, and that's true. So uh, you can find them on TV. You can find lyric lines in, you know, online, uh, any sites that you go to. Books. I had uh, yeah. somebody, you know, that I've worked with in my past uh some major multi-platinum artist who I can't remember which one, so I don't want to misquote, but they said books. I read a lot of books, and while I don't steal lines, I steal ideas. Uh, I'm, I yeah. can't come up with an idea for something they stole, but a concept, you know? I mean, obviously more... Oh, themes. Uh, you can come up with themes. Right, yeah. Yeah, from other people's songs. So, for example, that song I was using, Something in the Orange, that theme is we're breaking up and I'm not ready to let you go. That's a, that's a killer universal theme. And, and there've been hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of songs written on that theme. So how you can find a theme in a book, a movie, a TV series, anything, and then start, let that theme start your song. But I like to have a few lyric lines to go with it and go, oh, I like those. I really wanna go with that. And yeah, listen, one of my favorite places to get lyric lines is um, daytime dramas. Yeah. <laughs> Soap operas. Yeah, nothing's happening. They're just talking to each other and they're saying the most emotional things because everybody's over the top emotion. And that's when th these kinds of lines come out. And so that's so fun. You rewrite them. I've got lists of them and they're hysterical. I, right before the show started, I was telling Robin how much I loved 1883, which is the prequel to Yellowstone. Um, I, I watched the entire 10 hours on a plane ride. I had a 14 or 15 hour plane ride. I watched 10 hours straight without even getting up to go to the restroom. It was that good. And Ann House just put in the chat, watching 1883, lots of ideas in that dialogue. Absolutely. The guy who writes all this stuff, Taylor Sheridan, he writes Yellowstone, 1883 and 1923. He is an incredible uh, writer and he's also an actor that's been in a lot of stuff. And he's also a cowboy and owns a ranch. And, Texas or Montana or somewhere, and it, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe I'm surprised, maybe I'm just sexist, but I wouldn't assume a cowboy type of person would have so much sensitivity or be so in touch with emotional stuff. Even when he writes women, women's lines in the show, he does it so beautifully. It's like, wow, he's really evolved. <laughs> huh. Anyway, wow. I recommend that yeah. show to everybody and anybody. Anne House is right. Uh, 1883. It's that good and will inspire you. Absolutely. Anyway, what, what's your next one? Uh, let's see. Don't take your habits for your authentic voice. Okay, so we've been talking about habits. Habits are not a bad thing. A habit can help you write faster. But if you're doing the same thing over and over, you need some more habits. I mean, you need a lot of choices when you're writing, and those should be choices that occur to you spontaneously, and that's, that's, those are, that's habit by doing it over and over and over. What we were talking about, riding the bicycle, learning to balance, becomes a habit. You don't have to think about it. So you want more new choices um, for, uh, to occur to you just like your, all your habits do now. Oh, I could do this, this, or this, right? Now, habits, what happens is with people, the initial bunch of habits that you have, uh, which most of us have, are the habits we formed from listening to the music uh, when we were teenagers, usually. That's dangerous. Yes, it is, because as you always say, you can tell how old a person is uh, by the kind of music <laughs> that they're writing. And that's if they haven't formed any new habits since they were teenagers. There is something about the music we hear as teens, and I've read this in other places, it embeds itself more easily, it has all that emotion attached to it from from life as a teen and some things, um, there's something about it that it sticks with you. And that's when we form our musical habits. And as we write, as we get older, if we keep using those same habits, our writing becomes dated. So habits can work against you. The other thing that happens with habits that's unfortunate 
uh, is that people mistake them for their authentic voice because it just occurred to me spontaneously and it was the mm. first thing I thought of, it must be my authentic voice. Um, but it's no more your authentic voice than any other habit that you have because it's, it occurred to you spontaneously because it's the thing that's embedded in you as a habit from listening from what you heard when you were younger. So now what you need to do is begin to form more habits. And that's what we were talking about earlier, which is doing things over and over again. Don't just do something one time. If you go and you take a look at um, uh, a hit song, successful songs that you like, and, and you learn how to solve a problem, one of them is doing excellent and really interesting transition from the pre-chorus to the chorus. And you try that once. And you go, oh, it really worked. I'm going to put that in this song. But then you never do it again. It won't become a habit and it won't occur to you as a spontaneous choice. So what you have to do, listening to songs and analyzing them, playing along with them, singing along with them, embed it any way you can. What Michael was just saying, which is don't just do it once, do it over and over so that it becomes part of you you don't have to think about it it becomes a habit how it's do you not, know you're i'm yeah. sorry how do you know you're not ingraining a bad habit um how how do you know how can any of us be objective enough about our own stuff not that i'm a songwriter but if i were uh objective enough to go that worked out really well I'm, maybe they should bounce it off of other people or test it in some way to know when they've discovered a new good habit and it's something they've got to do repetitively. Otherwise, they're just going to be digging a deeper hole with more bad habits of, of yesteryear. Well, the bad habits of yesteryear do, yes, you bring up a really good point. And this one I didn't have in my list of nine. So you just made it 10. Okay. <laughs> get feedback from other people who are knowledgeable. You can't just go to anybody and say, do you like my song? I mean, you and I both know this happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. but my mom really liked my <laughs> song. I think that's wonderful, but it isn't for your mom. Um, and of course, your your family and your friends can fill in all the stuff that you don't tell them in your song that strangers don't know, because that you have right. to really play it for somebody. They know the know backstory that a stranger right. wouldn't, yeah. Yes, how much that meant to you when that heartbreak, you don't have to really convince them. You have to convince the strangers, and that's your listener. Those are your real listeners when you take the song out. So yes, uh, getting feedback from somebody who doesn't know you and isn't in your a family member um, is a really good idea. Now, when you're listening to successful songs, you're not likely to hear bad thing. You're, you're, you're going to hear you're going to be forming good habits because these are habits that work for listeners. Successful songs are, are songs that listeners like that. And that's what counts. That's what makes a song successful. Um, even Jason Flom says, you know, a hit song is one that a lot of people like. Um, and you can't force someone to like something. And I thought that was brilliant, you know, from the guy who was the head of, I don't know, A&M, the head of uh, Atlantic. Yeah. yeah. And he was the founder of Lava Records. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, this is a guy who really knows the music business. And he, he put it bluntly in an interview that I, I thought was brilliant when he said, it's, you know, it's what listeners like and you can't force them to like anything. So you have to find out how other people, strangers, listeners, are going to react. So if you take it to someone and you say, what do you, you know, give me your feedback, you know, then that's what puts you on, tells you this is how listeners are likely to react. So that's how you know. But if you're studying successful songs, then chances are you're picking up and forming really good new habits. And listening is just as important as writing. I know everybody wants to write when you sit down and say, oh, I, I, should, so I should write a new song. I've got to write, I, I need to be writing. That's what I want to do is write. But if you're listening like a songwriter, really listening um, and, and picking it apart and saying, how does this work? Why why does this song work? Why do listeners like this? Um, what is it, what is it about this that's working, that's expressing the emotion that listeners like so much? You can learn new new tricks, new techniques, and by embedding them simply by singing along with that song and embedding that pre-chorus to chorus change up or those t that type of lyric or the way the lyric fits with the melody, which a lot of times gives dated songwriters away. We fit lyrics to melodies a little bit differently now. 
and melodies especially give dated songwriters away because melodies have gotten more rhythmical they've gotten more repetitive there's more syncopation in them so and if you sing along with it you'll embed some of that go ahead le less lyric content is something i'm noticing just in the last six months it's like a, a tsunami of shorter more staccato rhythmic lyric delivery where there if you actually did a word count in lyrics on songs i'm seeing this over and over again it's like people aren't really thinking much about the verses they're putting all their bets on the choruses and writing some great choruses but um, i think the quality of lyrics is suffering uh, of verse lyrics is suffering because of it but yet the potential hit factor is going way up because they're doing exactly what you're saying which is paying attention to the rhythmic rig, rhythmic aspects of what they're doing and, and chopping their melodies more rhythmically as well and you put that together in a little blender and out comes a more infectious chorus but i do believe that verse lyrics not in country um nope. i sound very midwestern when i said that <laughs> verse lyrics no, it's true. Uh, it's true. I, yeah. my question is what have you been listening to because i'm not hearing that at all but um, in, in pop, yeah, I mean, in pop, yes, because it's pop dance. Yeah, pop, pop uh, and dance honestly, about, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was my New Year's resolution was to listen to more top 40 pop radio on LA's That's biggest pop radio. Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, hadn't done that in six months because of the road rally. So, and, yeah. and things seem to be moving faster now as far as new songs and new hits. So I've been forcing myself to listen to top 40, much of which I'm too old for it's not that relatable for me but I'm listening because I own taxi right. I mean this is pop dance and pop dance yeah. is about dancing it's about getting out on the floor and getting all sweaty and sexy and all that stuff and so <laughs> lyrics for pop dance which pop has moved towards pop dance and pop R&B yeah and and pop R&B is still fairly ly lyrically heavy but the lyrics tend to stay on a uh, they don't tend to go too dig too deep but again it's got those these are uses for this music and it's playing in the background people aren't paying attention but if you move over to as you said country rock americana singer songwriter all of the other genres are lyric heavy and people are really listening to lyrics so i think those those that are those those genres that are moving you towards body into your body rather than your than your emotions and your brain those are moving that way whereas even you know ed sheeran is just as chatty as he always has been um adele is just as chatty as she always has been so there's an ac quality still there but when you get into dance traditionally it's always been less lyrics I mean, Speaking. because as i said earlier edm is like you know just breathe and that's your lyric yeah. um so somewhere <laughs> between dance club and radio hits Dua Lipa, somewhere between that and Dance Club, you have these sparse, these sparser uh, lyrics, and that comes from Dance Club. They they really are sparse lyrics. They're not looking for anything deep at all. Americana. You and I uh, talked about that very briefly before we went on on the air today. Uh, we're seeing a big resurgence. I can't tell if it's going to last a week or a month or a year or become a, a thing for quite some period of time. We have seen a nice resurgence of Americana. It hit a dry yes. spell for a while. Yes. Just like country was persona non grata or songa non grata uh, in the world of sync. Nobody wanted country. Uh, and all of a sudden now we're getting country requests all the time and a fair number of them are sync but americana um and it's different than what americana was 20 years ago i'm not sure i'm expert enough on on americana but i did call the head of the americana songwriters association one time in nashville um, and said to him can you give me a very succinct definition of americana because i'm seeing them all over the place and I'm, i was doing a thing for the taxi newsletter on americana and his belief was that americana uh should be like john mellencamp or bruce springsteen that it's got to tell a story about something you know a very american life we're talking about a slice of life in america and i don't think americana is so much that anymore no. you know full no. americana way back in the day was kind of a 
a hipper, better version of folk maybe, had a little more tempo mm-hmm. and a little more rhyme to it. But they had that, you know, uh, standing yeah, so on a, standing on a breadline vibe, you know, and now it's nothing like that anymore. Yeah. He's thinking of Poncho and Lefty. I mean, we're th- yeah. he's thinking back to a period of Americana that included uh, the writers of the 1970s, um, and it continued on. And of course, Willie Nelson still keeps Americana yeah. alive. Um, and we st- and we have uh, Justin Towns Earl, and we have Nathaniel Rateliff, and we have just just uh, Jason Isbell, and we have Lucinda Williams, and we have a whole range of Americana artists who are really compelling. They are great artists, and so I'm gonna one of one of the I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit and do one of the other. Um, I have to be remembered to go back, uh, and so I'm gonna do um, do your research. This one of the things, one of the ways that you can improve yourself, and this is exactly what Michael was talking about, what he, you're doing. Mm-hmm. You researched pop dance in the top 40, and you looked at that and said, ah, oh, look at the, where's the lyrics, and the lyrics are devalued here, while melody and, and rhythm is uh, emphasized here. And so that's an observation that's perfectly true. And if aim for top 40, you should be paying attention to that. So he was doing his research. I was just doing research on Americana, so it's really interesting that he brings this up because when I was doing something in the orange, I realized that um, that song is actually, to my mind, that song is Americana and not contemporary mainstream country. Now, it didn't go to the number one on the mainstream country charts, but it did go to number one on the Hot 100. Mm -hmm. And I asked myself, why is that? And I began to look at that song. And one of the things I realized was that this artist, Zach Bryan, has had eight placements in Yellowstone and one live performance on Yellowstone. Which was great. I just just saw that like two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And in one season. And Yellowstone is the most watched television show of 2022. And so so it should be. It's great. (laughs) So this is from Variety, the Bible. I believe anything Variety says, and they say a most watched TV show. So this is really a nice sign for Americana because they're using artists that I hadn't heard of, and I'm learning, I'm finding new Americana artists. So if you're interested, you can go over to TuneFind, T-U-N-E-F-I-N-D.com, and you can look up Yellowstone and see every episode from every season and you can see the songs that they use. So I did some research over there and I grabbed some names and besides Zach Bryan, they've used Aubrey Sellers, Robert Earl Key, K-E-E. Those are, th- those are two that they've been using that, and I listened to them and I also found a guy, um, oh, let me mention these other series, besides Yellowstone. What Michael was saying about we kind of Americana kind of went dead for a little while. That was after um, the end of Longmire, Sons of Anarchy, and Justified. We had three big ones, and Breaking Bad also. They would all use um, some Americana artists in them, or a lot, and they all went off the air. Now we've got seven series: Yellowstone, Roswell, New Mexico, Station 19. Fire Country, which was on last night, right on CBS, right after the the end of the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. They're really going to push this show, Fire Country. And they used Zach Bryan this last season. They used something in the orange. Um, Tulsa King, Tulsa, T-U-L-S-A, as in the town, Tulsa King, K-I-N-G. Heels, H-E-E-L-S, which is actually a pro wrestling show on Stars, Stars TV. And they use... Um, Black Pumas, Nathaniel Rateliff, those are both Americana artists, Chip Taylor, and they also use a lot of roots rock, so and, and a lot of rock. So that's a very interesting show to, to, to be thinking about. And then Heartland, which has been running on and off for a long time. Um, that's seven Americana shows. And they're using, I started looking at the artists on TuneFind, and I found an artist named Voli Contra, V-O-L-I-C-O-N-T-R-A, hmm. a song called Wish You Would that just tore my heart out. It's a stomp clap and it's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Voli Contra, fabulous voice. Nathaniel Rateliff, who's kind of defines Americana for me right now. Um, Other uh, artists on there that I had never, um, Tulsa King is using more mainstream country, Luke Combs and Lainey Wilson. Now, both of those are a little more towards tradition. They are neo-traditional kind of country. They're not, they are on the mainstream charts. 
but there's a, a neo-traditional thread that runs through there. So I think we're going to be seeing this for quite a while to come. And so if you are an acoustic based artist and you want to work and you feel comfortable with um, Americana, I would be researching that pretty deeply because it looks like there will be a lot of shows. At the same I'm, time as I'm, yeah. I'm, <laughs> as you're talking about Zach Bryan being on uh, Yellowstone, just want to hold up the evidence that I, I literally watch TV with my phone in my hand and, and I'm uh, shazamming stuff all the time. And I knew Motorcycle Drive-By was him. Um, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with The Good I'll Do, but yeah, he had quite a little run there. Mm -hmm. Season five, he got a lot yeah. of stuff in that season and deservedly so, man, he's great. He did Motorcycle Drive-By. They had, had it playing in the background once and then they had an outdoor event with a live band on stage yeah. and it was Zach Bryan. Was and he played that. And I gotta say, he did a great job on the live version. Good, oh, yeah. good. Yeah, he's an interesting artist who's taking a lot of chances in a lot of different ways. And um, we'll see what happens with his career, but boy, he's hot right now. So you want to look at that when you see an Americana artist suddenly become hot like that, and you're looking at the charts, the country music tends to swing, the big charts, the mainstream charts will swing from neo-traditional to very, very slick pop country, and then back Can again I to neo-traditional. put you on the spot and ask you to write me like a 300 word article on female Americana artists that our members should be paying attention to for right now. Uh, I could, I need something for my second feature in the upcoming newsletter, which will come out at the end of February. Uh, and I was really having a hard time coming yeah. up with something fresh, but I could see how people are reacting to the, the Americana subject in the chat room and yeah. uh, especially female Americana. So if you could, it, it doesn't have to be, don't write a book. I know you can't stop when you start. I know you well enough, but uh, yeah, 300 words. And uh, I would really appreciate that. And I'm sure our members will appreciate it even more. Okay. Okay, Thank you. I'm just yeah, really into Americana, so I'm happy to do that. And it is a little harder to find a uh, female Americana artist, but in alt country, which is a little bit slicker than Americana. Americana sounds like it was recorded on your back porch. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> it's pretty raw. And Lucinda Williams, I mean, the, it's, it really is raw. It sounds authentic. It's, a, it's character driven. Mm -hmm. And um, now we're getting more universal lyrics in there, not the stories that you were talking about earlier. We were looking at Poncho and Lefty. Those are the story songs from Americana. Um, but for film and television, we are looking at a little more universality there. And um, But in alt country, which is also being used, that's just a little bit more slick. It doesn't quite sound like the back porch. Um, you know, everything overlaps. Everything overlaps. A um, lot. But you're dominated by women. So I'm going to probably bring in a couple of the, the women, um, Brandi Carlisle, Dar Williams, uh, Jonathan Brooks, and Lori McKenna, and Aubrey Sellers, and they're just dominated by women. All um, right. So interesting area to be looking at. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do this in 300 words. but Right, I'm not. I'll just make a <laughs> list of names. Go listen to them. <laughs> All right. Yeah. What's your, your okay. next suggestion uh, for 2023? Yes. Okay, I skipped one uh, in order to get over to um, uh, do your research. Uh, know your And the one I skipped, who I wanted to do before it, is know your genre. So we're talking about Americana, and you may be sitting there going, well, I don't know if I'm Americana or not. Until you do your research, you, you won't know. And genres, as I did at the road rally, the first virtual road rally a couple of years ago, I did a thing on genres. And what I said was, genres are like colors. You know, we're very comfortable with the word green. If I say green, um, you, I, I could mean lime green, khaki green, olive green. I mean, I could mean any green, but you know kind of what I mean when I say green. That's a genre. And then all of the subgenres come off of it. The subcolors are all subgenres. But because we didn't grow up with talking about music the way we talk about colors, when I say Americana, everybody goes, what's Americana? Well, it's like green. And uh, coming out of Americana are a number of other uh, subgenres. Um, but you can, in fact, if you look at it, you'll get that overall idea of it's fairly raw. It has a back porch quality to it. It's um, the characters that you use in, um, 
in Americana are a little bit rough around the edges, a little bit raw in the voice. They don't always hit the note exactly right. So for example, um, Tom Petty would be considered roots rock, which is Americana. Bruce Springsteen is considered Americana now, although he didn't used to be, he used to be considered rock. Now he's considered Americana or roots rock. So roots rock harks back to our early years, Alejandro Escovedo, he, roots rock. You hear a lot of 60s rock in there and then you hear all of this great acoustic guitar playing and uh, this feeling of, you know, raw rocking out energy. It's, it's the antithesis of today's pop dance. So yeah. you can think of it that way. The best way to think about genres is to look for genres that you like who, and then look for the genre that they're in. Reference artists that you are like, that you think you sound like, that people say you are like. Um, take a look at those and then take a look at the genre they're in. You can find that on Wikipedia. One of the things I love about the taxi listings is you tell us what genre those songs are in. So you get three songs with every genre. So when Taxi's looking for Americana, grab those artists and pop them into your Spotify and, and look for similar artists and look for fans also like, and start being creative about how you find um, That's art, right. similar artists. Go down the rabbit hole. It just make sure you stay in the same rabbit hole if you're on a mission to learn about a particular genre, because it's very easy to branch off. You know, think of it as an inverted, well, the roots of a tree. But yeah, yeah you yeah. want to stick with the big central root. But um, and thank yeah. you for mentioning the the taxi references because the A and R team really does put a lot of effort into that. Uh, it, it's usually one person taking point on it. In a perfect world, we get the references, which we do probably 30, 40 percent of the time. We get references from the companies. Maybe they'll just give us one. Maybe they give us three. But then we have to uh, elaborate by going into Spotify and elsewhere and doing the research. Um, and then that person who takes the lead, does the research, will run it by other people in the department. Do you think that this is an accurate representation of Americana? So we may not be perfect, and there are a lot of blurred lines, but I can't think of a better place to get um, on-target references for the genre. So thank you for mentioning that. I agree. I think it's a very underused resource. Um, very under you. I recommend it to everyone. Watch those. Get, even if you're not a taxi member, go ahead and get those listings. Get on the email and get those listings every day and start watching for those genres that you think you might be in. And then you can start getting familiar with, getting, you know, kind of just, it, it's, you know, let it surround you. Let, get an idea of what the range is of the genre. Could I logic could i fit into that play some of the songs on spotify from that genre and mm -hmm. then put your song after it and see if you it would be a flow for listeners who like those songs would they also like yours right uh, if not then start adjusting yourself so that you can get a little closer because sometimes it's production sometimes it's the way you're delivering your vocal sometimes it's your lyric or your character is too careful if you're doing americana other you times, mentioned something yeah. before that would be a really good tie-in, which is writing to a beat. You can go, if you're a Logic user, and I'm sure that there are other ways to do this with loops and such, but go into Logic and use Logic's drummer program and, and try and match the beat of an Americana song that you love and have a lot of respect for. And then don't touch it for a few days so that other song goes in the background, but just take the beat and see if you can come up with some original ideas on top of that beat. At least now you've got the basis for writing Americana because you've got the tempo and you've got the basic beat. You don't have to match every little nuance of the beat, but the basics. And I think that was a great suggestion to write to the beat. Um, you know, obviously top yeah. liners do that all the time now, but people think of top line is mostly in, in pop, top 40 uh, kind yeah. of stuff. But you could absolutely do it to, uh, and just finding just a pure drum beat, which Logic's drummer makes it so easy. Anyway, just thought I'd toss that out there. That's a great, uh, that's great. And um, there's another source for beats and that's um, uh, karaokeversion.com. Mm. Uh, karaoke track. Now, if the song is successful enough, you can find it on karaoke version. They have a ton of stuff and they do very, very good versions uh, of these songs. And you can download, get a custom mix, it's $1.99, $2.99, I think it is, $2.99, um, and download just the drums or download wow, the drums I didn't and know the that. bass. 
or cool. download drums, bass, and guitar, whatever you want to write to, and um, and and it's another way to do it. That's even that's quite easy. But the problem is they don't have like album cuts off of a, you know off of the album of, by somebody who didn't have any hits. Uh, right. But they will have a lot of these songs, and um, that's something I recommend to people. And if you want to t- practice writing top line. Uh, you can go download any of these hits, these big Dua Lipa hits, and just get the drum track and top line to that. Add your own chords and and start singing your little heart out. Absolutely. All right. What's your next one? Okay. Um, oh, okay. This actually is my last one. Okay. And this is a biggie. Um, write what you love. Um, and I know that we all want to be in the business and we all want to get our songs placed and we all want to... Uh, you know, sometimes we're thinking about the business a little more than we are thinking about uh, what we want to write. There are times when so what you write, you know, is for the bedroom wall. And there are just times when that's what you should do. Because if you don't do that, your, your, your body and your inspiration, and your creativity are going to give you a hard time if you don't respect them and what they're giving you. So, you know, when you get a song, I was talking about this to my students recently, when you get a song that's a story song, you go, oh, I can't pitch that to film and TV. I, so let's, can we make this into a film and TV song, Robin? And <laughs> I, every time I try that, it, the song is weaker than when it started, and I won't do that. So as that, to me, that's a travesty. That's just a sin. And so I back away and say, no, I can't do that. You are writing a story song, and it's an important story, or you wouldn't be writing it. Uh, I have one client just writes these magnificent stories about her parents and her uh the the work that she does as a caregiver i mean it's just magnificent and she kept fighting it and and she was stuck she couldn't write and uh we finally released all that i gave everybody a big talk about story songs a story song is a song in which the events express the emotion thing one happens thing two is really harder thing three knocks this veteran back on his heels but he comes back again eventually that's what i mean when you you know when you have a song in which the events cause uh the this this characters to feel emotion when we write universal lyrics for film and television we write about a single moment and we go deeper into what the singer is feeling in that moment and we're not interested in the series of the events that happened before or, or during uh, what the singer is feeling. We just want one moment. So if a story song occurs to you and you want to write about your life, you want to write about something that happened to you, you should go ahead and do it and, and give your, your creativity the respect. And this is where I started with inspiration. Mm-hmm. Respect your inspiration. If it gives you a story song, you say, yes, thank you. Let's do it. And you take the time to write that whether or not you end up finishing it or you love it and you do finish it and you put it up on social media um there are other places for songs like that um don't get so hung up on what you want your brain wants to do that you forget what you're you don't pay enough attention to what your creativity and your inspiration and your emotions are telling you they need to do the other thing about writing what you love is this um you can't write a song that you don't like And I think sometimes people try to do that. Um, The reason you can't write a song that you don't like is because how will you know when it's done? How will you know (laughs) when you don't like it enough? Okay, I hate that song. It's it's finished. I'm done with that one. Okay, so the person who told me this was the great songwriter, Jeff Berry, who who has written 600 plus songs and had huge hits going to the chapel and the do run run. And he wrote all these theme songs for TV. I mean, it's just an amazing songwriter. And he's the one who told me that. And I, I, I took that home. He, he, what he said was, you can't write a song you don't like. And uh, because how you know when it's done. And I thought, about that for the longest time. Uh, he didn't explain it to me. And I finally had to figure it out. And years later, when I ran into him again, I said, Jeff, I figured it out, this thing that you told me. And he remembered the anecdote. And he said, yeah, but somebody told it to me. And I don't know who it was. I don't. I can't credit him. But I thought about it for a long time and <laughs> finally understood it. You can't write a song you don't like because every choice you make while you are writing a song is based on what you think feels right. That is what we do. There is no listener sitting there. There is no audience sitting there. Strangers telling us, yeah, I like that. I really like that. Everything you do is what you like. And you make that choice and say, yes, that's what I'm going to do until you reach the point where the choices are all finished and you like them all. Then the song is done. 
And then you can take it out and have somebody say, well, I think you should change this. Up to you whether you want to change that. Maybe they've got a better idea that you didn't think of. And you'll go, yeah, I'd like that even better. Okay, I'll do that. That's rewriting. When you yeah. keep something until you can beat it. Keep something until you can beat it. Don't throw something in the trash and say, I'm a terrible writer, that's an awful line. Don't ever do that. Just find something better. When you do that, then you give yourself the respect that's due for the line that you wrote and the respect to, for beating that line or writing something better. Um, that's how you keep your own respect as a songwriter for yourself. You validate your own talent. You keep yourself going. If you get validation from outside, so much the better. Money is validation, but validation is also people saying, your song moved me. And that's why I think social media is important. It may not pay you very much, if anything, but it's important because people will hear your song and they'll say, I love that song. That song moved me. That song helped me when I was feeling down. I love that song. I too had a Jeff Berry experience. A, a very dear, now deceased friend of mine named Bob um, had, had written some stuff with Jeff Berry. And for Bob's 60th birthday, there were a lot of songwriters at outdoor backyard uh, party. And Jeff Berry and Cynthia Weil were sitting at my table. And uh, I've got to say, he was... Um, still insecure and i don't mean that in a negative still doubting how great he was i i talked to him i said jeff you sound like you don't know what you've accomplished or how good you are and he goes oh we all still worry about that which i found hysterically funny i mean the guy's written hits that will be you know remembered decades from now but anyway. that's true yeah but it's true you never reach the point where you say aha i am great I have written a perfect song. Because if you ever got there, why would you ever write another song? Because and you could we, write another perfect one and another one and another <laughs> one. <laughs> no song will be as perfect as that one ever. <laughs> well, I, I want to add a couple of quickies uh, to your list and then get to some live Q&A because we should have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of this. A lot of people have been oh, asking yes, questions yeah. today. Um, collaboration. To become a better songwriter in 2023. You know what? I've seen it literally thousands of times over the 31 years that I have run Taxi, and that is people get stuck in a rut. They sit alone in a room. They don't get any better because they keep repeating the same mistakes. They can't be a good judge of their own material. They finally listen to me, and they collaborate with somebody because they became friends in the chat room on Taxi TV or on the forum at the road rally. And they light up like, wow, my life has been changed because collaboration, you may be strong at lyrics. Somebody else's strength is melody. Or maybe you're a great top liner. You can't produce a track to save your life and they can do it. Collaboration in all of its forms, get over it. It may, you may have a few bad dates. You may have a breakup. Um, it, Sometimes it goes swimmingly well right from the beginning. There are usually a couple of bad dates at the beginning, but hang in there because eventually you find your mate. And when you do, you get into a groove. The number of things you write, the speed at which you write, and the quality of what you write all become exponentially better because two heads are almost always better than one. So that's collaboration. And the other one is... I used to do this years ago, even though I'm not a songwriter, and I sometimes think, well, someday I'll retire. With all the stuff I've learned, mostly from Robin over the years, maybe I should try my hand at songwriting. I don't think I will. But uh, I used to write down stuff that I got. I'm not going to hold the book up again, but see the blue book over, Rob, over top Robin's head, Shortcuts to Hit Songwriting. When she first wrote that book, uh, I used to take some of her ideas and the Do It Now things in the little boxes on the pages and I would write it on a post-it note and stick it on the bathroom mirror every morning come on let's face it we all go up we go to the restroom we brush our teeth we all have a routine if it's on the bathroom mirror you don't walk past it you have to look at it when you brush your teeth and just repeat it out loud because for things to embed, it takes repetition. It is like muscle memory. It's mental muscle memory. She's got so many great tips in her books, both of them, that um, 
just say say it. Peter Rahill says my wall is covered with post-it notes. Um, there you go. Anyway, that's my suggestion. Let's do some Q and A. We've got 14 and a half or 15 and a half minutes left. If you've got a question, write the word question in all caps just to make it easy to pick out. Um, and we are going to give away a book. You know what? Uh, no, I'll wait till 25 after the hour. We'll give away a book. And I'll tell you what. Um, I do ask that you're in the United States because it's really hard for us to ship these books, which are quite heavy because they are laden with great information. It's hard for us to ship them out of the U.S. and Canada. Um, and she does have e-books. Hang on. But um, we're not allowed to gift somebody an e-book. In another country. Yeah. yeah. Yes, in the U.S., yeah. Yeah, That's so really it's a Come pain on, in the tush. Thank you, Amazon. They get so much right, but not that stuff right. Yeah. Um, all right, so the first question is from Ban Brothers. Not Ben, but Ban. Uh, opine about rewriting, please. Okay. <laughs> so I already gave you one, yeah. which is don't throw out something until you've got something better. Beat what you've got before you throw it out. Okay. Rewriting, I think, has a lot to do with um, when you get to your second draft, um, the rewriting really starts when you're really working on that third draft. Um, the second draft, you put your, you put your, some of your uh, um, song craft underneath your, you know, you're supporting your emotion pretty well. And, um, but you've got some placeholders, you know, so some lines that are a little bit flat and you think they could be upgraded. So what I'm looking at usually in rewriting would be um, imagery. Okay. Imagery is visual images, but it's also um, uh, all of the senses, uh, taste, touch, smell, aud you know, auditory, all of your senses. Um, give us, you know, some, some lines that help us see and hear and taste and touch what that what's going on in the song give us some of those because by that time you may not have done any of that yet imagery is anything that helps the listener imagine the world of the singer it's not just images it's imagery and it says okay anything that helps you imagine what's going on here uh, i'm gonna put in my song and uh, add those so that usually comes in about the time that you're rewriting um because maybe you've been just getting your idea down and getting the sketch out and getting everything arranged the way you want. Now let's put in the color orange, or now <laughs> let's put Go in back to the, the orange. flavor <laughs> of an orange. You know that you know that summertime to me means summer. Um, let's put that citrusy smell in, into the summer. What your perfume as you walked past that summer night? I mean, give us that. That usually happens in rewriting. So think about imagery as you're rewriting. Think about the tracking. Does it track all the way through so the listener can follow you? It doesn't mean that you have to write song uh, lines that you know tell us exactly what's going on, but you do need to suggest it in every line. Is every line leading us towards your payoff line at the end of your chorus? Or the, or the first line of the chorus, is it all leading us there? Or have you got lines that maybe still belong in another song? Maybe you need to pull that out, put something else there. So that would be what I'd be looking at. Imagery, pr primarily imagery, and then also does the song track? Does it say what you want to say? Um, does everything sing well? Um, I'm not too worried about rhyming. Uh, maybe you could freshen up your rhymes at that point. If you want to, I think fresh rhymes are important. That means using vowel rhymes, uh, long A, to, you know, rhyming the long A, but don't worry about the consonants, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I think in rewriting at that point, the meat of the song is done. And what you're trying to do is make sure that the listener is as involved and engaged as you can make them. And that has a lot to do with imagery. Speaking of things that rhyme, I've got a question from Riney Bear. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I stayed up late to put that one together. Um, and if I may, I'm going to answer this one, even though I'm not a music attorney or a copyright expert, but I play one on YouTube. Um, if one downloads or copies a beat to an existing top hit and writes a new song with it, is that copyright infringement or is it safe to use that technique? Well, first of all, you don't want to take the actual recording of it and include that in your song. That would be a copyright infringement on the master recording. 
I don't believe that a beat is something that is copyrightable, if that's a word. Um, I, I would, yeah. huh, it is like my Sharona, my Sharona is so singular that they might consider, yeah, but, well, but I'm just talking like kick I mean, to, when I said take a, you know, a, another song's beat, like what's the kick doing? What's the snare doing? I, I said, don't copy every little nuance, but match the tempo and where the kick and the snare are, and okay. you should get what you need for the basis of the song. But please elaborate. Yeah, Rob. there's a couple of things. When you said a beat, I thought you were talking about the beats you can license and buy and those kinds of things. There are plenty of sites out there. Uh, beat Stars is one of them. Beat Stars is one. It's very good beats. Um, and those are pretty fully formed beats with no vocal on them. And they're not hit songs. They're just beats that these producers have put up. And you can license them for cheap, but you don't have an exclusive license on them. But you can pay for an exclusive license, and then you do own it. So, um, if you wanted to use to get a beat off of offline from you know a, a website, w read the read what your the agreement says very carefully. Very carefully. <laughs> yes. Sometimes you can't pitch it to film and television. Um, so read that. Make sure you have ownership. When you buy it, it's much more expensive to buy an exclusive beat and have it exclusively to yourself. But what Michael was saying and what I think you were asking was, um, it, you were saying in, in Logic Pro, if you use the drums or you've got Easy Drummer or something like that, then as long as you put something on top of it and make it a new song, you can use that anywhere. And that's what they say. Just make sure you're not selling our beat. Um, you can't do that. But if you put a song on top of it and some chords and some other things, it is yours to use. There's a gray area. No, I take that back. It's not gray. If you're going <laughs> to download, yeah. if you're going to download a karaoke track, you do not own that karaoke right. version of that. So you cannot use that. So here's what you do: if you write I something did. to a karaoke beat um, or a non or a non-exclusive beat that you've gotten hold of. Uh, and you want to re replace that with something exclusive, uh, find a producer who will replace that for you. There are taxi producers, there's people on the forum good enough to do that, absolutely. And you pay them uh, to create that beat for you and replace that one. And what you want to say to them is, I don't want to copy it. Uh, I don't want a copyright problem. Like you say on My Sharona, that is so recognizable. I probably wouldn't want to copy that given the way that court cases have gone re uh, lately. But um, anything else, just ask the producer to vary it enough that it'll be yours. And then you're going to put your own song over it, your own chords. Um, you know, change. I would change up some of the chords and I'd change up some of the chord voicings and things and then put your own song on top of it. And it should be different enough that it wouldn't be a problem. Um, here's an interesting question, if I can get back to it. Uh, from Brian Grantham, if I reference a song title in my song as part of the lyric, so let's use My Sharona again. Um, I'm really missing My Sharona. Um, so now it's embedded in the song title. Do I need to get a license and or give a co-writing credit? Um, here's <laughs> what I would say about that. Um, my Sharona is very recognizable. You could say, I'm really missing my Sharona. I'm really missing Sharona would be fine. Um, I'm really missing my Sharona. Maybe you'd be okay with that. I wouldn't use the long and winding road um, <laughs> as your payoff line. That's the problem. It's where you use it and how litigious are the people that you might be offending and how recognizable is it and, and are you using it in an important spot in your song? Yeah, so well. the long and winding road, if you use that as your payoff line, you're in trouble. Everybody, everybody becomes litigious when they see dollar signs at the end of the road. Yeah. Uh, very yes, few people. Beatles, well, the Beatles estate is known to be litigious and, yeah. and they will really come after you. So if, if that song, the long and winding road that you title your song because it's the payoff line, if you do that, chances are you will be sued because it's a civil suit. Anybody can sue you. Right. And, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's your fair game. So I would say err on the, uh, on the side of caution, um, always, and don't use something that's as recognizable as my Sharona or the long and winding road. If you wanted to use, it's a long, it's a long and winding road. Um, didn't, um, Cheryl Crow's have a song, uh, today's a long and winding road or something. Um, uh. 
Been, uh, you're in the ballpark of that title. I remember. I can hear the song. Every day is a winding road. That's it. Every day yeah. is a winding road. I mean, you can do that, of course. Yeah, but that's so, not long and winding road. Yeah. But, you know. Use your judgment and ask yourself, would I sue somebody if they did that to my song? Um, Ken Mesford made a comment. It's the bass line of my Sharon that's recognizable. If you took out the yes. bass, um, I wouldn't know. I think he's trying to say wouldn't know the song from yes. just the drums. Uh, just want to throw it out there that one of our longest uh, screening, Prescott. yeah, Prescott Niles is one of our screeners. He played the bass on My Sharona. And he's yeah. at virtually, he was at the Road Rally this year. He has screened countless songs for taxi members over the years. Limited range of stuff that we've got him on, but he, uh, he writes really long, detailed critiques. <laughs> Great guy. He's yeah. got wide knowledge, classical to jazz to every. He's a musicologist. Yeah. Um, I said to him one time, I had heard the song recently, and I said, "Man, Prescott, that bass line, it just you just can't hold still when that song is playing." And he said, "Oh, it wasn't the bass? It's the drums. I want you to know, it's just, the drummer did that. He is so modest and so sweet. No, yeah. Prescott, it's the bass." <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be diplomatic and say it's the combination of the two. Um, let us give a book away. So here's what we're going to do. No early starters. Remember last week, you guys got in trouble for starting early. Had to call the class, you know, call the principal in and make the class sit down and be quiet. Um, the road ain't short and it's too curvy. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to give away either book to the winner. They are both sitting on top of Robin's head, shoulders in the shot. I'm not going to hold up mine because I want to turn green again. Um, so we will be happy to send you, if you're in the United States or Canada, um, if you're out of the country, please don't enter because if you win, unfortunately, literally it costs more to ship it than the book costs. And I can't go on Amazon and say, send one to Betty at her house in Ireland. It just doesn't work that well. So I'm very sorry about that. Anyway, uh, let, today we're going to do a plus R for Robin instead of plus one. We're going to honor, honor Robin's return to Taxi TV post road rally. Um, so type in a plus R and um, I'm going to have Liz who's sitting about 50 feet away from me in another office do the flying thicker, what do you call it? Fickle finger of fate. Flying finger finger, finger, of, finger of, of fate, fate. Yes. right. <laughs> I try and say that without freaking yeah. it up. Um, <laughs> and she's going to go boink and wherever her finger lands is the person who's going to get the book. So here we go. Blackheart Champ, that's just did like five in a row. Um, I didn't say you can't do that, but still. All right, um, and Liz will let us know when she's got a winner. The plus R principle, says Ken Mesford. Very, a very good observation. I, like I have that. no idea what he's talking about, but <laughs> Kevin Walker. You are the winner. Kevin, are you in the United States? Please, or Canada, please respond in the chat room. And then can I tell people a little about my newsletter coming yes, up on Thursday? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, oh, all right, Kevin Walker is. So Kevin, when the show's over, you can email either TV at taxi.com or Liz at Taxi, New Jersey, what exit? Um, I used to live in New Jersey, I can say that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, there, there was a like a Cheech and Chong or something, I can't remember, one of the old comedy movies that thing, oh, you're from Jersey, I'm from Jersey too, what exit? Because that's how you talk to people in Jersey, what exit do you live off of the parkway or, or the turnpike? Anyway, um, Kevin, email and just put in your uh, subject line in all caps, Taxi TV book winner, 
and Liz will grab a copy of the book for me and send it out to you and you should have it in your hands in about a week. And yes, tell us about the newsletter. Ah, oh, so this Thursday, my monthly, I do this once a month, I send out a newsletter that has either a song tip in it or a song guide. When I look at a hit song and I go down deep into it and you can go with me. Um, and it will be coming out on Thursday and you can sign up for my newsletter. E the easiest way is to just go to one of my websites, mysongcoach.com or that one's the easiest one and there'll be a little pop-up that comes up right on the on the page and uh, you can sign up for my newsletter right there. If you awesome. want to read some of my song uh, in-depth song guides, you can go to my other site, which is robinfrederick.com and click on uh, Secrets of Hit Songwriting and there'll be a list of 50 hit songs that I have looked into um, and, and done the deep dive into. So that's my newsletter every month. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, as always, for being an awesome guest and doing a great job. The crowd mm -hmm. loves you, Robin. Um, and I want to mention next week I'm doing a show on Do You Need a Middleman? Um, somebody who's work online on YouTube that I respect and, and think this person does a, a really good job. Did a whole show uh, on scams of the music industry. And I thought he was a little fast and loose with uh, his descriptions of what some scams might be. And the category of middlemen fit in there. So I am going to do an entire episode of Taxi TV next week on Do You Need a Middleman? Um, I'm going to preface it with a little tea. Oh, no, I'm not. It's behind the green screen. Never mind. Uh, just don't miss next week's show. And uh, Robin, thank you so much for doing this. If you guys aren't a subscriber yet, hit that red button and subscribe. Um, give us a like because we're really sad and lonely. We like to be liked. Now, YouTube's algorithm likes it when we're liked. Um, and, and click the little bell so you get alerts when we go live. Thank you so much for joining us today. With that, I bid you a fond farewell. Farewell, and here is some wonderful taxi theme music from our friend Keith LeBrant. Bye-bye. See you next Monday. Bye.